Hello and a very good morning from BBC One. At seven o'clock it'll be breakfast time, but now we begin our day as usual with the Pink Panther. Now on BBC One, the National Weather Prospects with Francis Wilson. Not too bad for many of us uh, today, which will make a nice change, but I'm afraid more rain is on the way. A spell of rain is coming in from the Atlantic. It's this thing here. Meantime, this um, block is holding. You'll see this uh, rotating and slipping down the North Sea, holding very ugly weather over the northwest of Europe. But this, nevertheless, has got enough momentum now to actually penetrate particularly the southern half of Britain, bringing a spell of wet weather during particularly tonight and tomorrow morning to southern England. Meanwhile, as you can see, North Africa, the med, blissful sunshine expected once again. Let's catch up then with how this has all been moving around. And you'll see this is holding and this is trying to come on, but this is the one that's giving it the umph to come across the southern half of England with a good deal of rain. So closer in, what it means is that a nice clear slot and, and sunny and dry and fine and summery for many people a bit of cloud coming into the north you'll notice but all the time these clouds in the southwest approaches are gathering and eventually they'll bring rain right across the south and it's only a matter of timing really that's the problem so now the forecast chart begins like this there's a little bit of rain getting into the left hand side of Ireland it's clouding over here there's sort of broken cloud over the rest good deal of sunshine this morning it's only three degrees Glasgow Edinburgh and then the clouds are also gathering in the north of Scotland but it's going to be dry there I think by um, midday take a look at midday I think rain into this particular southwest quarter and very slowly pushing on over southernmost counties meanwhile a lovely fine a summery day for a change there will be bubbly cloud but I don't think you'll get the thunderstorms and showers of the last few days so essentially just dotted scattered clouds but nice by um, six o'clock I think the rain right across Wales just beginning to get towards London by six the rest of the country doing okay and tomorrow that batch of rain will begin to clear at about midday the back edge will be something like that still be cloudy over a region like so and the rain here at midday and clearing away the winds today then at midday like this the temperatures this afternoon once again below seasonal norm in all parts best are probably in southern Scotland in fact uh, the pollen count will be moderate in many areas the summary chart for today local weather to come In the Midlands, everywhere will be dry at first this morning, but rain will reach the southwest Midlands around lunchtime, spreading to all parts of the region this evening, and some of it will be heavy. Top temperature, 17 degrees Celsius, minimum tonight, 8 degrees Celsius. That's the weather. The first Midlands news is at 7.15. Join us then. This is BBC One. It's now 7 o'clock, and breakfast time with Sally Magnusson and Pamela Armstrong. Hello, it's 7 o'clock on Thursday the 18th of June and this is the BBC's Breakfast Time. Good morning. The news headlines. Britain has withdrawn four more diplomats from Iran. They've been recalled for what the Foreign Office called precautionary measures. Holiday flights could be disrupted this summer. The Civil Aviation Authority says a big increase in air traffic means it'll have to restrict flights at peak periods. And Wales have taken third place in the World Cup Rugby Union finals. A try in the last minutes gave the Welsh an unexpected win against Australia by one point. Morning, Pamela. Morning. And also this morning, the American drive to recruit British nurses for their hospitals. What can or should the profession and the government do about it? Edwina Curry will be here. And as Parliament prepares for a full resumption of business, we meet the man caught in the middle of many a Commons row, the Speaker, Mr Bernard Wetherill. Plus, we look at the dangers of designer dogs. The Veterinary Association warns the breeders. And from Canada, Guy Mitchellmore on the great balloon assault on the Atlantic. A very good morning to you from St. John's in Newfoundland, a city which is famous for its fishing industry, famous as the oldest city in North America, and famous as the place where Alcock and Brown took off to fly across the Atlantic for the first time. 
but will it also become famous as the place where Don Cameron and Jim Howard took off to become the first men to cross the Atlantic in a hot air balloon? Well, you can find out how our gallant heroes are getting on. They're now here in Canada in the first of my films from Newfoundland later in the program. And we'll have Guy's report in about 10 minutes. Britain has recalled four more embassy staff from Iran, leaving just two still in the mission there. The move has heightened speculation that all diplomatic links could be broken. Officially, it's described as precautionary and not as a response to the most recent expulsion of British envoys. That's still under consideration. Meanwhile, Britain has underlined the importance of observing diplomatic rules. Last night, the rules. Foreign Secretary, Sir Geoffrey Howe, hosted an official dinner for the heads of foreign embassies and high commissions in London. The Iranian chargé d'affaires was notably absent. Without naming Iran, Sir Jeffrey said diplomatic relations had to have substance and should not simply be a facade. The crisis in relations between Britain and Iran began when Edward Chaplin, the first secretary in Tehran, was abducted and beaten up in retaliation for the arrest of an Iranian consular official in Manchester. Mr. Chaplin flew home last week. Britain closed the Iranian consulate in Manchester and expelled five of its staff. Since then, the tit-for-tat moves have continued apace. The latest departures leave just two officials at the British mission within the Swedish embassy in Tehran. The Foreign Office says the decision to bring home another four diplomats from Iran is a precautionary measure and should not be seen as the government's official response. Last week, the Foreign Secretary said he was giving urgent and serious consideration to the form of that response. Iran still has 16 diplomats here, there are fears any further measures could affect the fate of British hostages, including Terry Waite, thought to be held by pro-Iranian groups in Lebanon. But the latest departures from Tehran have heightened speculation there could be a complete break in diplomatic relations with Iran. Holidaymakers could face big delays this summer because British airspace is full up. The number of flights has increased so sharply that the Civil Aviation Authority has announced it may have to rearrange arrival and departure times. The CAA say it's had to take this step in the interests of safety. Tony Charlesworth reports. More and more people want to fly to the sun this summer and it's threatening to produce traffic congestion in the sky. The Civil Aviation Authority expects an increase in flights in and out of Britain of up to 25% at peak times. So to cope, the airline schedules may have to be changed. The CAA says that inevitably and regrettably this will lead to some delays in flights. The main difficulties would be at Heathrow and Gatwick. To add to the problems, staff at the main London Air Traffic Control Centre in Middlesex are in dispute with the Civil Aviation Authority over pay and working conditions. The air traffic controllers there supervise one of the busiest air spaces in the world, but their representatives say they're overstretched and undermanned and that the equipment they work with is no longer up to the job. The computer system, they say, is 16 years old and breaks down. The CAA totally rejects the charge that the system is unsafe and it points out that the number of incidents involving risk has fallen over the past 10 years despite a big increase in air traffic. With me is the chairman of the Civil Aviation Authority, Christopher Tugendhat. Now, you say that you're going to have to rearrange arrival and departure times. This sounds very ominous for the holiday maker. How bad is it going to be? No, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that the volume of traffic has increased very steeply. And that we're introducing a system so that if it looks as if the number of aeroplanes in the sky over Britain is reaching a point where our air traffic controllers would find it difficult to cope, then we will restrict the flow. If you think of a motorway, a motorway fills up until it becomes congested. You can't do that in the airways. You have to have traffic lights to prevent people coming onto the motorway if it's getting too full. It'll only be used sometimes. It may not be used very often, but it's much, much better to be safe than sorry where aviation is concerned, and we're determined to continue to improve our very good safety record. How are holidaymakers going to be affected? Well, if, and I use the word if, if they are affected, then there would be some delays in arrivals and some delays in departures at peak times. Would they get warning of these delays before they get to the airport? They may, they may not get warnings of those delays before they get to the airport because so much depends on the flow of traffic that's coming in from overseas. We know what's happening in Britain, but of course the vast bulk of British uh, air movements 
comes from outside this country. But doesn't a lot also depend on the morale of your air traffic controllers? Because you're currently in dispute with the London area, aren't you? Now, if you're working against them, as you must be to a certain extent, this is going to affect holidaymakers as well. No, we're certainly not working against them, and nor are we in dispute. We are in negotiation. A dispute is when you have uh, strikes or stoppages. Well, they're complaining, they're complaining about malfunctioning of your computers. They're also, you've had two near misses lately, and they are very worried about Listen, the situation. Listen, the air miss situation is far better than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, when and the level of traffic was much less than now, there were 45 air misses. In 1986, when the volume of traffic had increased enormously, there were only 16 aircraft. It's very important to bear in mind that the safety record has got much better. We're trying to improve the situation. We've already installed a new computer at the Oceanic Terminal in Scotland. We're going to install one. We're spending at the rate of £200 million pounds over the next five years. And when are these negotiations going to end so that it won't actually threaten our holiday makers no, and their you've travel? No, you've mixed up two quite separate things. The flow control arises from the great increase in traffic. The negotiations over working practices and all that sort of thing happen to be taking place in parallel. But even if they weren't taking place, even when they are finished, if we are to preserve safety in the skies, then we will have to have this system, which has been used for many years in the United States and for many years on the continent. But it's but very it important be to, to keep the two separate. But would it be better to have happy air traffic controllers this summer? Oh, of course we want happy air traffic controllers. But if we are to keep air traffic controllers happy, we must not impose too many aircraft on them at any one time. Christopher Tugendhat, thanks very Thank much. Thank you. There is a new crisis in the Gulf, which is already bitterly divided by the, the Iran-Iraq war. The ruler of Sharjah, one of the most stable of the Gulf states up till now, has been deposed in a bloodless coup by his brother. The country is said to be a billion dollars in debt. It seemed to be a textbook takeover operation, but Sharjah is one of seven sheikdoms comprising the United Arab Emirates, and they are divided over the coup. So today, a delegation of sheikhs will start negotiating with the brothers to try and find an agreeable solution. A not unimportant task, given that the last thing the Gulf Arabs want at the moment, as they try and stand united against the threat from Iran, is a division in their own camp. The size of the British Army garrison on the Falklands is to be reduced. The Ministry of Defence refused to discuss numbers, but it's believed 400 fewer men will be stationed there after a battalion comes home next month. It'll be replaced by a reinforced company. The MOD says the new airport in the Falklands means troops can quickly reach the islands in an emergency. Police and anti-government demonstrators in South Korea are preparing for more confrontations. The, de the protesters have declared today anti-tear gas day. Police have begun using an especially strong gas after nine days of clashes. The current protests against the government of Chun Du Hwan has attracted support from a wide range of groups, including Korea's middle classes. Wales have won the playoff for third place in the Rugby Union World Cup. Australia had a man sent off early in the match, but they led by five points in the fifth minute of injury time. Wales followed up a Jonathan Davis kick ahead, and a sparkling move put Adrian Hadley over in the corner. The match depended on Paul Thorburn's conversion from the touchline. It succeeded and Wales had won 22-21. And there'll be a full report in the game from Bob Wilson at 20 past seven. Today, civil servants step up their industrial action with strikes in Scotland, Northern Ireland and England's North East. The main unions involved are the Society of Civil and Public Servants and the Civil and Public Servants Association, who want a 15% rise from the government. Their actions likely to cause disruption at many levels, from dole payments and VAT processing to driving tests. Now, as the unions intensify pressure on the Treasury to better its 4.25% pay offer, they're extending disruption of freight to more of Britain's ports. Russ Peters is chairman of the Road Haulage Association's international group. Mr Peters, how is the action affecting road hauliers at the moment? It's been sporadic. Um, when they have gone on strike, the queues in the ports have grown day by day. Some of the ports are working better than others, and one has to find out which is the best port to use before setting off. We have a situation where some of the officers, the senior officers, are working, the non-union staff are working, and there have been instances where the union staff not agreeing with the industrial action have also worked. 
but this can change from shift to shift. So most people are telephoning before they set off to find out if their port is still going and then setting off wherever they can. And what about your own firm? How, how bad is the disruption to your business? We have been affected undoubtedly. Um, we have been trying to get out before the strikes have started, but uh, as you probably know, they have said they're going out on strike on Sunday evening, but in fact have gone out on Saturday evening to try and catch companies like ourselves. Um, by and large, I think the industry has performed very well. There haven't been many complaints to the uh, Road Haulage Association, but uh, as the action is stepped up, then obviously the delays will come more. There has been talk of some drivers becoming so frustrated that they're going to blockade the ports. Is, is that likely? I think it's a possibility if it gets worse. I would expect drivers working for companies such as our own not to take such action because they are, after all, on pay no matter what. But the self-employed British owner driver and certainly the foreign drivers who don't like and certainly don't understand this, this, this dispute could well start to think in terms of a blockade. Um, I can't say that I'm in favour of that. Though. Ross Peters, thank you for joining us. Thank you. The great balloon crossing of the Atlantic could begin this weekend. Now it's all down to the elements. Both Richard Branson and his challenger, Don Cameron, hope to be the first to cross the ocean by hot air balloon. The Virgin Atlantic flyer with Richard Branson's crew will take off from Sugarloaf Mountain in Maine, USA. It could be ready to go on Sunday. Don Cameron's Zanussi balloon is all set and the crew is now just waiting for perfect weather in St. John's, Newfoundland. Guy Mitchellmore is with them. Thank <laughs> you.